Before we get started uh, today, I want I, I just did want to make a couple of announcements about um, homework because um, just a bunch of things came up that I thought it's it's probably better for me to say something about. Um, so uh, the first is we had a we had a uh, couple of people inquire about our solutions, right? And so our solutions are, to the homework are generally much more involved than we would expect from you. In fact, we wouldn't even want you to do that because. It's, it's not the point, right? We, in this class, we don't care about little corner cases and things like that. We, we don't care. But we write solutions usually that are a bit more involved. In fact, a lot of the solutions are for things where we initially didn't even ask for a justification, right? So um, we're, we're just writing. So our, our solutions we're writing, uh, just they, wouldn't, they might not quite pass muster in the math department, but they'd be awfully close. And we are absolutely not expecting that of you. So for people who look at the solutions and go like, whoa, like that's a long solution and what are all these corner cases? You don't have to do that, okay? So uh, that's the first thing, just to reassure you. Um, CVX Pi um, had some questions and I, so I just wanna say, make one announcement about this. Um, whatever you do, do not treat the coding assignments where you do CVX Pi as kind of a, at a monkey at a typewriter thing, like type stuff in and say, oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't, ex and, then, and, then th and then conceptualize it as, I have to find out a way for CVX Pi to accept what I'm saying. This is exactly the opposite we want. And if we detect that at any time, it's going to piss us off. And bad things happen when we get pissed off. So um, anyway, it's not the point. So the main point is this, um, dis in discipline convex programming, you know what you're doing. Right, so if you type in, if you type in something that's non-convex and then like post something saying, I don't know, CVX Pi doesn't accept my, you know, my something squared equals three constraint, that is uncool. Is that's, that's, that's all I'm going to say, at least in this class, very uncool. So uh, I'm just saying that you know it's not the right way to t do a programming class, and it's definitely not the right way to approach these problems. So. So, I mean, it's perfectly okay if, if you have some syntax thing or something. I mean, everyone at some point in their life is going to declare a variable x. Later, uh, think that x is actually the numerical vector after you've solved it. Plug in x somewhere and it's going to say, what are you doing? Uh, Python will because, well, x is an object and x dot value is what you want. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Everyone will confuse an, an equals with equals equals, right? Equals is actually an assignment in Python, right? Um, equals equals um, is actually a special thing in Python. If it, if, sorry, in CVX Pi, if it, if it occurs between two CVX Pi expressions, that is over, so expression equals equals expression is overloaded to be a constraint. And it is only a, you can form it all you like, but you can't solve a problem with it unless both the left and right hand sides are affine. Everybody see what I'm saying? So I'm just saying, please, I know, you know most of you are, but, but please just ma make sure you're kind of present thinking about what you're doing and not just typing stuff in, right? So that's, because that's not the spirit of it. Okay, all right, that was weird, but I needed to say it. Um, oh, uh, the other question was about, you know, we start doing some of these kind of practical-ish problems. Actually, some of them are quite, are actually quite real. Um, I mean, real versions of them would be not much more complicated, frankly. So instead of writing a 10-line script, you might write an 80-line script and have more stuff in there. But nevertheless, they start getting real. Um, and a couple people have asked, um, how do you, you know, when you, when you work on, on those problems, how do you know you actually did it right or something like that? And so here, I'm going to give you a hint. We design those problems. And we design them typically in a way where you can check, at least intuitively, that something good happened, right? Sometimes we ask you to compare it to some kind of simple solution, right? And then if the simple solution is worse than yours, <clears throat> something's not right, right? If, if you're doing, let's say, a problem on optimizing operation of some energy storage devices or something like that, if you add, just, so here, even if you're in statistics or you know, biology, doesn't matter, it should be clear that you know, if we give you energy storage, the cost should go down. I mean, this is just completely you know, simple reasoning, right? The cost should go down. So what you should do at that point is, um, is check that that happens. If it doesn't go down, uh, by the way, of course, 
in some real problems, you set up a problem and what you end up with is not better than some simple solution, right? That, that actually does happen. It doesn't happen here because it kind of undermines our message here. Um, also, it doesn't allow you to check that what you're doing. So, so don't just do the problem. Even if it's a field outside the one you're in, don't do it and then mindlessly say, okay, there it is and plot something. Just sit and think, just give yourself five minutes afterwards to think and go, okay, that's cool. I saved money by storing energy when it was cheap and dumping it back in when it was expensive or something like that, right? Everybody see what I'm saying? So this would be, so I just, I'm just saying, please, please do that uh, for, for those things. Um, okay. Oh, and the last thing is I, I had a, a bunch of questions and I, I'm not even sure I know how to answer it, but people have just said, I don't know how to approach these. And I just want to say a little bit about that. Um, so I, first I should tell you the design, uh, the design side, what we do on our side. Here's what we do. Um, so we don't do silly things like, you know, teach you, you know, duality and then say, find the dual of this. Because that's basically high school, like, you know, here's integration by parts. What's the integral of T squared sine T, right? Like, come on, this is ridiculous. I mean, not only could, you know, anyway, that's, that's just, we're not, we don't do that here, right? So the way we do it um, is we actually, you'll end up doing problems related to the material we cover, um, sometimes in practical problems, and we won't use the words that appear. We won't give you a hint. Well, sometimes we have to, but sometimes we don't. So here would be an example. We have many stealth problems that actually will rely on duality, and we don't use the D word. Okay? Because the truth is, that's the way it's really going to go down. If you're at an internship, if you are at a startup or something like that, no one's going to come up to you and say, oh, help me, help me. I think we can use like a theorem of the alternatives to, to solve this problem. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is they're going to come to you and say, oh my God, this is so complicated. It's unbelievable. We have this estimator and that thing and these estimates and that, and we need to combine. And it'll go on and this is, you know, and it'll be some long complicated thing. And your job will be to go somewhere quiet, think for a while and go like, whoa, we can solve that, right? Um, and it'll be through duality. So just, just to let you know, that's, that's what we call it that. That's using the ideas in the wild. And that's what we're interested in. We might give you a warm up or two that's, you know, in like a little sandbox or something. But after that, it's going to be in the wild. So watch out. Anyway, I just want to say that's the design of a lot of the practical problems. So um, what else was I going to say? Uh, maybe that, that, that's it. Any, 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 any questions? About that? Yeah. Why in reality we can get a solution that is not as good as a principle? Oh, uh, yeah, I get, okay, so it's, uh, it, it wouldn't, if it's solving exactly the same problem, then of course that can't happen. So that, that, yeah, I, I shouldn't have said that. Um, it could be that you get no improvement. That would be, that would be one, right? And that certainly is, is a thing, right? You say, Oh my God, I'm, this is so, I, I got a great idea and I have the storage device and it just doesn't help you at all, right? So yeah, I, I, I misspoke when I said that. Oh, and I forgot to, uh, I, I did want to announce on the midterm, how did chat GPT do? <laughs> my, like seven. No, no, no. It was like, come on. It was like 50. Uh, actually, I can open it up right now. So let's Okay. Well, I think the executive uh, summary is terribly, I'm happy to announce. <laughs> So, so uh, anyway, anyway, well, anyway, that, that's, that's, I just wanted to, to, to mention that. Okay. Yeah, 12 out of 43. 12 out of 43. 12 out of 43? Yeah. Uh, that's not very good. Okay, so, so that's fine. But I'm sure it was beautifully written, right? It, it was articulate and, and, and sounded like it was right. Right, so... Um, Okay, so we're gonna, we'll get back. Today we're going to finish off what is essentially the theory sec actually in about 20 minutes, we're going to finish off what is essentially the first section of the course, which is basically all the theory. I mean, as you can see, we've already segued into real stuff as well. Uh, and then we'll start the second part of the course, which is just all applications, right? So that, that's kind of the idea. Um, and then the whole idea, by the way, as I've said many, many times, we don't expect you to have a total mastery of all the theory we've covered, which is actually a lot. So what will, happen, what will happen is as you do other practical problems in the next three, four weeks, um, hopefully there, that will be your excuse to go back and review something in the theory or learn it better. 
Um, and in fact, I know a lot of people say that after the, very weirdly, they say somewhere around the seventh week of the class, it turns out at that point, they really, they go back and they look at the third week and they're like, yeah, this is all obvious. Like, how could I not have known all this or something like that? So anyway, okay. So, uh, okay, the, one of our last topics is this question of duality and problem reformulations. And we looked at this last time, right? I, I think I drew a diagram and I said, here you have a problem and then I convert it to a new problem. So these are like equivalent. And of course, you can sort of take, you can take a dual, right? And this would be the, this would be a, the, a Lagrange dual of this one. Um, oh, and I should be careful what I'm saying there. Um, so you could, people say the Lagrange dual, but the truth is when people talk about duals, you have license to make a few small ch transformations of your problem, right? And they still, and actually sometimes you can do different ones and then you get different duals and they have like people's names. Like you could talk about the Clark dual of a QP or the Frank dual, and they're slightly different, right? And that, that has to do with people doing a small, uh, making small changes, equivalence, you know, making an equivalence transformation, then taking a dual or afterwards. Okay. And then this one would have uh, a, a dual right here, like that. Uh, I'll just write it this way, uh, like that, tilde, right? And Anyway, so the, the question is, you know, how are these related, right? And, you know, I said that if you're, if you're trained in math, you will have an overwhelming urge to draw an arrow here and, and say that these are related in some way or something like that. I mean, they're obviously related because these two, they are, each one is the dual of two problems that are equivalent, right? So assuming strong duality holds, which we will simply assume from now on without, I won't say anything else, right? because this isn't a math class, I would say, then you'd say, look, they have the same optimal value and all that sort of stuff, right? So, okay. Um, it turns out this is just not the case. And we'll see incredibly simple examples where transformations give you radically different duals. Okay, so that's, uh, which is actually kind of interesting. All right, so let's start with uh, the following problem. So here's, here's one. Um, let's minimize a function of, an affine function, right? An F0 is convex, right? So then, oh yeah, by the way, we didn't get to talk about that. We didn't get to, let's cover the theory of Lagrange duality for problems with no constraints, right? So, okay, so what's the Lagrangian? Well, the, there are no constraints, so there's nothing to add to the objective. So the Lagrangian is nothing but the objective, okay? Then it says, okay, that's fine. And now let's find the dual function well, the dual function of the no, there are no dual variables because there's no constraints, but it's a dual function. And it says you should minimize this objective. Anyway, when you do that, you get P star. Okay, and then this is, okay. By the way, that is, it's correct, right? Uh, number one, let's observe, it's a lower bound on P star. And you have to admit that, right? It's also and completely and utterly useless, right? Because someone says to me, says, help me solve this problem. Actually, I, what I really need is a lower bound on the optimal value. And you go, I got a great lower bound for you. And you go, what? The optimal value, right? And it's like, you know, it's like, I, there's several jokes where the punchline is like that. Those people had to have been mathematicians. And you, some people say, why? And they say, oh, because the answer was precisely correct and totally useless, right? So have, has anyone heard these? I'm not going to reproduce, you've heard them. I'm not going to reproduce because they're all terrible. Anyway, but that's the idea. So that, that's what this is, right? Um, okay. Um, so now let's make an innocent transfer. Uh, we're going to make an innocent transformation from P to P tilde. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to introduce equality, uh, introduce new variables. So we're going to give this a name that's going to be called Y. And we're going to write this problem, which is, ob this is obviously equivalent to that, right? So that's, that's our P and our P, P tilde. This is P tilde. And now when I work out the dual of this, I get something that looks like that. And it's highly, it's, it's not useless. It's interest, you know, it's actually an interesting dual, right? Um, and I won't, you know, this is a, a quick calculation to show that the dual of this is if I minimize F0 plus new transpose times this thing, I can express that at, in terms of the conjugate of the function, right? So, okay. Um, so this is kind of a, a dramatic example saying that even the most simple, innocent looking transform, trans, if you apply an innocent transformation ahead of time, you get a radically different dual. 
including in the first case, you get one that's just utterly and completely useless. In the second case, you actually get something that's interesting, that actually tells you something, right? So, okay. Um, we can look at another one just for fun. Um, is we'll look at the norm approximation problem, which we're going to look at later today. So that's, that's choose an x to minimize norm ax minus b. And again, you know, it's kind of silly to talk about the Lagrange dual of a problem with no constraints, right? So in this case, we introduce constraints. Um, and the constraints we introduce are we give a name for ax minus b, and you get this kind of thing. And you end up with a very interesting thing, right? The, the, this is the norm. Uh, by the way, I could take the norm squared, and I would get a different dual, right? So I'd get a completely different dual if I, if I took the square. Um, I'm not going to do it, but you might check into that. Um, and, and the dual, when you work this out, is this is the norm plus, then there's a constant over here, that's irrelevant, and then this whole thing here is a linear function of x and y, and if I look at y over here, uh, and I minimize this over y, what I get is the indicator function of the dual norm, right? So you end up with something that looks like this, right? Um, and so the dual, or I should say like, you know, a, a, a dual of, in fact, some people would even say a dual of that problem is this. And then someone would say, no, the dual of that problem is just silly. It's maximize p star over no dual variables, right? Which is kind of goofy, right? So, um, but in fact, people would, would allow you this license and, and you get something here. And by the way, by now you should be starting to see patterns, which should be, you know, uh, when you see a function appear in the, in the, what's called the primal problem, then in the dual, you should kind of expect to see conjugates, okay? So if your original function, for example, had like kullback leibler divergence or relative entropy, then you should, even before you start doing any calculation, you should expect to see exponentials and log some exp in the dual. And if it doesn't show up that way, then that's kind of a, you should maybe double check what you did. Everybody see what I'm saying? Um, so here, the other thing is you should, there's some other obvious things you should know. I mean, you should, you should expect to see the adjoint or the transpose. If you see an A here, you should not at all be surprised to see an A transpose appear in the dual, okay? So I won't, I mean, some people make, you know, tables of this about, you know, what you expect to see in one or the other and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's better just to think of it as patterns that you should expect and you should, you should, so you, you should just be preloading. There should be things you should expect all of us. If you, you know, if your problem is, involves L infinity norms, the dual should probably involve Conjugate of an L infinity norm, or not conjugate? Of what? You, you should get an L. You should expect an L one norm, exactly, right? So it's just it's stuff like that. Um, these are things that you'll you'll you, you will see patterns. Okay. Um, this is what people refer to as something called partial uh, the partial dualization or partial Lagrangian. What what you do is um, you know here's an original problem. And uh, if you work out, uh, you know, it's a, this is an LP. And when you work out the LP, you get something that looks like that. Okay? The dual of that LP, right? So another way to do it is to say, you know what? I am not going to dualize over this. People call that a box constraint, right? It's the constraint that all your variables are between plus and minus one. You see, I'm not going to dualize over it. Instead, I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to make an indicator function of it and plug it into, C trans and into the objective, right? So obviously it's equivalent, right? So this problem is clearly equivalent to this one, right? The, the difference is here you would say that the box constraints are explicit. Here, the box constraints are implicit because they're embedded in the objective and it just makes the objective return plus infinity if you're not, if you're not feasible, right? Make, make sense? So, all right, well, we can actually work out a uh, Lagrange dual of this. So here, uh, here, remember what happens is you form, uh, you form a Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is actually an affine function of x. Then you minimize. But when you minimize an affine function, you just either get minus infinity or you get, or you get the constant part, but only when the linear part is zero, right? Um, here it's different because here I have to minimize uh, here um, an affine function of x subject to all the entries between minus one and one. That we can do analytically, right? Because the constant part, that's, my, that's new transpose minus b, that pops out. 
And then here you end up with a linear thing, a linear function of x. It is in fact a transpose nu plus c quantity transpose x. And we want to minimize that over all x's between minus 1 and 1. And this is, you know, like Cauchy-Schwartz, I guess it's called the Holder inequality. And the whole, that says the best choice is to take, you look at the entries of this vector. Whenever it is positive, you take x as minus 1, xi is minus 1. And whenever an entry is negative, you take xi equals plus 1. That will minimize. And the minimum value is going to be the sum of the absolute values with a negative sign. And so you get this. And, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. And so you could even say this box. So other people would say this box constrained problem um, has this simple dual here. And it, it kind of, everything's matching up, right? Uh, that, you know, you can think of this, this, you could have thought of this as the L infinity norm of X is less than one. So then using those weird vague rules I said before, you see an L infinity norm, you should hardly be surprised if in the dual an L1 norm comes up. And sure enough, it did. Okay, so this makes sense. Then um, an interesting thing is, it turns out this is a case where there is a nice bar here. Because in fact, if you stare at this long enough, you, you will see something really interesting. Um, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both non-negative. Their difference is equal to C, C plus A transpose nu. And you're asked to minimize, to maximize the negative sum of lambda, the lambda 1 plus, minus the lambda 2s. When you, when you look at that closely and stare at it, you'll realize you know precisely what that is. This, the optimal value of this thing is exactly that. And in fact, if you were to write, express this as an LP, it would be that. So this is a case where, the, where, the, where D, D and D tilde happen to be extremely closely related, right? So, okay, make, make sense? Um, last topic, and then I'm going to mention one more thing, um, is uh, problems with generalized inequality. So remember what this means, that what we're going to do is we're going to have an inequality constraint where that's a vector. Uh, and you have a con and the constraint is now that instead of being less than or equal to zero as a scalar, it's actually like a vector. So I mean, it could be, for example, this could be a matrix, and this could mean that the matrix is negative semi-definite, for example, right? I mean, more often it would be a matrix is positive semi-definite, but anyway, something like that. Um, so here, it turns out everything just kind of works, which means that all the notation was good. Um, so here's what you do, is you form a Lagrangian by, you know, the equality constraints don't change. But for the inequality constraints, we do the same thing. Remember, if this was scalar, you would just say lambda i times fi. Lambda i is bigger than or equal to zero. And remember, the constraint is fi is less than or equal to zero. But now they're vectors, right? So it turns out what you want is to form this inner product. And, it, and what, what it's going to turn out is that lambda i should be actually... Uh, lambda i is going to have to be um, non-negative in the dual cone, right? Which again, kind of makes sense here, right? So here's the Lagrangian, and then here's the 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 the, the dual the dual function. Um, and then the lower bound property is the same, right? Because what happens is if these if these vectors are bigger if they're you know bigger than or equal to zero in this in this uh, generalized inequality, right? Then it turns out that that uh, that dual function is a lower bound on p star, right? And the way you do that is it's identical to the other one. In the other one, there's no transpose. Lambda i is a scalar, f i is a scalar, and we use the deep fact in that case that the product of a non-negative number and a non-positive number is non-positive. Here it is a little bit more, right? We're using the fact that if I give you a non-negative a vector that's non-negative in the dual cone. And the inner product of that with a vector that is, did I get that right? Yes, non-positive in another cone, in, that, in the cone, then the inner product is actually less than or equal to zero, right? So it's not much more complicated, but that's it, right? And then you get a dual problem, and everything works later, everything. All, everything just works. Um, and we'll look at just the last example of this. But it's kind of cool because this is stuff that, I don't know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, no one knew this, right? Would have been just stunning. But here it is. Um, here's a semi-definite program. You're minimizing a linear function. I, I get that maybe this is an inequality form, right? Subject to, this is called an LMI, a linear matrix inequality. It's supposed to look like a linear inequality, except 
these are symmetric matrices, the F's and the G. And that inequality there is with respect to the positive semi-definite cone. Okay? Then the Lagrangian looks like this. So here I have to take the inner product of what I would call lambda. Here I'm going to, instead of lambda, I'm going to call it capital Z. It's going to be a symmetric matrix. And you should read trace of Z times that's the, uh, the, the error, or, or, or this minus that. Um, you should read that as the inner product. So this is basically what, what lambda transpose Fi or F1 of X would be. That's, that, that's how you should read this part. And here's the Lagrangian. And the dual says I should minimize this over X. I mean, it's complicated because these are, there's symmetric matrices flying all over the place. So, but it turns out this is simply an affine function of X and the same story holds, right? If you minimize an affine function, it's going to be minus infinity unless the linear part vanishes, right? And so it, if, if it does, it says, you know, right, if I, if, I look at the, if I look at how does this depend on x1, and the answer is it's c1, x1, that's from here, plus, and then trace z, f1 times x1. And so those two added together have to be zero. Otherwise, if I take x1 going off to plus infinity or minus infinity, I, I can make this thing minus infinity, right? So, so you get this. And then you end up with this dual uh, semi-definite program, and it looks like that, right? So it says, you know, to minimize, you know, uh, so a linear function over this LMI, this problem, this is, this is, this is now what, it, it's dual. And it, I don't think it's obvious. Like you wouldn't, uh, I mean, if I, it's not difficult to, to show parts of it. Weak duality is, rel is completely straightforward. Um, strong duality is not obvious. Um, but that's it. So, okay. So that, that covers that. And again, you, you probably get some chances to do some of this on homework. Um, okay. Actually, before I go on to this, I just want to mention one more uh, topic, which we didn't cover in the lecture, but we're expecting you to know. Um, it is actually duality for feasibility problems. That's what it is. And the name for that is called theorems of the alternative. Um, and the way that works is pretty simple. Um, and I'll just say a little bit about it, uh, but you will encounter it. Um, you may, you'll, I think you're encounter, you may be encountering it now on the current homework. Is that, yes. Is, is, there a, is there an option pricing thing? Yes. Sorry. You will be encountering it now. Of course, I just gave that away, but that's fine. Sorry. Um, so, uh, but that's okay, right? So the basic idea is you write a feasibility problem as minimize zero subject to, you know, fi of x is less than zero. And let's make it convex. So, but it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, hi of x uh, equals zero, right? So there's your feasibility problem. This thing has optimal value zero if, they're, if, it's fee if these constraints are feasible. Otherwise, the optimal value is plus infinity. Right? Because if it's not feasible, there's no x that satisfies this. And by completely standard assumption or definition, the infimum of the empty set is plus infinity. Okay? So, so this, this has either p star equals zero or infinity. And you can work out what the dual is. It's not complicated at all. Right? And it's going to turn out, you're going to get d star. And then th interesting things are going to happen. This always holds. All, that always holds. Convex, non-convex, doesn't make any difference at all. It always holds, right? And this would tell you some cool things. Like, for example, if this was, let's say this is a, a set of non-convex inequalities, right? But if I form the dual, and the dual, if I find the dual is unbounded above, meaning d star is plus infinity, what can you say? It's not feasible. Yeah, the original one is not feasible. I would say, well, how could you say that? That's, I'm sorry, that, that problem is like NP hard to determine if these inequalities are, are feasible, right? What would you respond then when I said that? Yeah, you just say, yeah, sorry, but it's completely elementary that this is a lower bound on the optimal value. And in fact, it would be good enough if I, had, if I worked out the dual of this. If I found a point, you know, some lambda and news for the dual, and I evaluated it, and d star was equal to 1. What could you conclude? What do you conclude? It's invisible. It's invisible. 
And the argument would go like this, which is actually kind of interesting, right? That number is either zero or plus infinity, okay? If I tell you one is a lower bound on it, well, hello, but now the only possible value for this is plus infinity. And that means precisely that your problem is, is infeasible. Everybody got this? Okay, so I mean that was just a whirlwind tour. You'll find, and these are generally called theorem of the alternatives because they basically say this set of when it's okay in the convex case it says this set of inequalities has a solution if and only if these this other set does not. Everybody got that? I'm just giving you the big, high, you know, big, uh, broad strokes description of the topic. Everybody, and there's some famous ones like. For linear inequalities, it's called Farkas, the Farkas Lemma or something like that, right? And this comes up in lots of different things. Uh, uh, one is it's kind of the basis of most of a lot of classical economics and, and finance, right? Because there, everything would be based on the idea, I'd say, here's a bunch of stuff you can invest in. If you can invest in these things and never lose money in all cases, and, some at, and under some circumstance make money, that's called an arbitrage, okay? And then a lot of finance says, or a lot of, kind of, you know, a lot of classical finance says, that can't happen, right? Because if that happens, the prices would readjust in such a way that it can't, you know, somebody would go in and exploit it and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So actually, my friends at hedge funds will assure you it can happen. <laughs> so. Um, which is why actually I know some one of my friends there said there was one department in a back in a, in a in a person in a candidate's background that they would just instantly throw it away. Economics. I was like, why? They said, oh, we'll take oh people in EE, we love it. Applied physics, oh, fantastic math, great. And I was like, why not economics? And they said, why? They looked at me and they said, why would we hire someone who's you know who comes from a field where the most deeply held belief that where the entire thing is constructed on absence of arbitrage, he said, which is precisely what we do. So that, that kind of made, anyway, that's, it was, we all laughed. It was mostly a joke, but not entirely, I have to say, sorry. Okay, no, okay. Uh, all right, this actually finishes up like part one of the class, which is all the theory. Um, I mean, it's, it's already obvious that it's useful. And what we're gonna do now uh, for the next like three, four, three weeks, I think, is we're gonna look at um, applications you know, broadly grouped, in, in, and you, what you'll see is after a while, they start all looking the same, because guess what? They are all the same. So, so but instead of doing it that way, we'll have some uh, organization. And actually, what you should be figuring out is just, you're gonna sort of just get the idea of things you can do, and then you'll be doing practical problems on them and all that sort of stuff. So we'll start with just approximation and fitting. Um, so uh, we'll start with some very simple ones. Norm approximation says, you know, uh, I have a matrix A and B, that's data in the problem. Um, and you would like to choose X to minimize the norm of AX minus B, right? And I don't know, lot, lots of ways you can think of this, right? Um, so you could say that, for example, X star uh, is the point for which A X star that's the point in the range of A that's closest to B as measured by this norm. I haven't said what the norm is. It's any norm, right? So that would be that. So you could do you know, L1 approximation, L infinity approximation, right? Um, uh, in estimation, this would come up this way. It would, it, you would come up, uh, and this is uh, not yet with a statistical interpretation. So at first it's just, uh, just a common sense interpretation. And it would go like this. You'd say, I have a, a, a linear measurement model and it looks like this. X are the parameters you want to estimate, right? Like, I don't know, they could be uh, things you can't directly measure. Like I could set off explosives, have some uh, geophones or whatever that would, that would look at the train. Or I could, I could, fly, I could fly a magnet, magnetic anomaly detector over some region, which would detect incredibly small changes in sort of in the magnetic field. Um, and this would have something to do uh, with what, you know, what's, under, what's a kilometer underground, which I don't know. And that, that's what X would be. So A, people refer to as actually, there's very interesting names for it. One is called the model. It's also called the forward model. That's a very interesting name for it, right? Um, and anyway, so that's the idea. So the forward model usually comes from, let's say, physics. And it tells you, well, yeah, if there were these point sources here, 
then, and they diffused according to this model in physics, then these are the concentrations of carbon dioxide we would measure at various places. Everybody following this? I mean, this is just kind of the basic idea of this. So that's typically called the model or the, con or the forward model or something like that. And then, of course, no one would believe y equals ax for many reasons, right? Because there's stuff, at the very least, you might have just sensor error. Like, how well did you measure, how well do you measure carbon dioxide? And you go, well, it's plus minus, you know, whatever, you know, three parts per million or something like that. I mean, the minimum, right? You're going to have that. And it could be other stuff. So that's this model. And the point here is you know y, you don't know x, and you don't know v. And so the, but, but someone asks you to please guess X, right? And so what this does is actually interesting. Oh, by the way, because I haven't said anything about V, like any possible value of X, any, any value of X is possible, right? Because then I would just change V, so to V would be Y minus AX, which is the residual. Actually, some people call that, it's a beautiful name, they call it the physics residual. It's a beautiful name. That's when this is kind of very, when it's a physics a real thing, right? Or something like the physics residual. And then they, so you could explain everything by physics residual. So I could say, well, I took my carbon dioxide measurements and you go, cool. Uh, where do you think the sources are? And you go, oh yeah, I think I decided there aren't any. And you go, excuse me, we, we took all these measurements and we're getting all these carbon dioxide, you know, things. Like, what are you talking about? And you go, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure it's, it's just zero. And you'd say, but what are all those measurements? And you go, oh, that's just measurement error. And you're like, anyway, so you see what I'm saying? So you can say anything you like. So, all right. So you need some idea of how plot, because that, it means you can say, you, you actually kind of like weirdly legal, although it is weird, you could actually announce that it's anything you like and, and cover it up by, by presumed measurement error, right? So, um, so what you need is, you know, you need to talk about plausibility of the value V. Now, later, We'll, we'll be doing this in a statistical framework. V will have a distribution, and we'll look at something like the maximum, we'll look at maximum likelihood or something like that. But for now, we're just saying, I need some measure of plausibility of V, and the measure here is this norm. So you simply say, I, I don't know what the measurement error is, but, I, but my basic assumption is that this norm expresses implausibility for my measurement errors. Everybody got that? So if it's like L1, that means something. If it's L2, if it, that means something and so on. Okay, so, and that's this problem. Um, okay, um, another one is another, you know, broad area where you get normal, is optimal design. So X, X are design variables here. Um, AX is a result. Um, and then X star is the design that best approximates the desired result, but that's in this, in this, uh, in this particular norm. And so the norm there says, how much it irritates you to, uh, to miss the target B by a certain amount, right? So, so for example, uh, you know, here would be, get me a sequence, fi find me a bunch of thruster firings on a satellite. That would be X, it's a long sequence, right? Um, that moves you to some target place. You can't get there. And then the question is, well, if you can get there, that's great. That's kind of the solution, right? Because norms don't get smaller than zero. But if you can't, this says, you know, what, what, what would make you happiest about, uh, ab about missing, right? And you'd say, okay, it, it'll be the two norm. And that just means get me as close as possible to the point that's moving along your target trajectory. If you can't get there, minimize the number of meters from that track. Okay, everybody got that? So that, anyway, it's just to give you some rough ideas of where these come up. So, okay. So, I mean, least squares, everybody here would know. Um, so in least squares, it's a norm approximation problem, but then you reflexively, you square the norm, and then you get, you know, something that's differentiable, convex, you take gradient, you get the normal equations like this, right? Um, and then you get some solution. So that, that's, that's quite old. Um, when you use infinity norm, it's called Chebyshev approximation, and that's an LP, or, or I would say people, you, you can convert it to an LP, right? Um, yeah, you can have sum of absolute residuals. Um, that's even got a name in certain fields. Um, and again, that's also, uh, that's also can be converted to an LP. Um, by the way, um, people don't really need to know that now because in things like CVXPy, you just type, you literally, you just type these in. You literally, you write norm, you know, AX minus B comma one. That's it, right? Like you can just do what one line solve, right? So 
it would be something like problem of minimize a times that norm a times x minus b comma one then you have a certain number the correct number of right parentheses right uh, uh, then you go dot solve and, and I just constructed a problem and solved it in one line everybody hopefully by now everybody gets what I just said okay um, and you so you don't you don't actually need to know this but it's not bad to know um, okay now we're talking about something this is super interesting it is super important and don't overinterpret it it is as simple and dumb as it sounds okay so that that's that's the that that's and also it is unbelievably useful so here's what it is um, I I want ax to be equal to b instead of a norm though I'm gonna have this penalty function and it's gonna be separable separable means it's a function is a sum of functions of the individual components that's separable so here it is and then these are just functions from r to r right and if it's quadratic this becomes least squares right if if phi of u is the absolute value of u this is l1 approximation but now we can do cool things like um, let's see this is here's quadratic right here this one um, here here's a crazy one dead zone linear so I th these are just uh, these are not standard names but anyone would get it dead zone means there is a a zone here where you just you don't care right and then outside that zone the penalty grows linearly right um, and here's another one log barrier that's that's this function here it agrees really closely with a quadratic uh, for small values but for large values it actually it starts going up and it goes all the way to infinity and outside some uh, some band plus minus a it's just plus infinity okay so one way I, the way I actually think about these is you anthropomorphize all this and it's actually kind of correct so what phi is telling you is phi of r tells you how irritated you are for a residual of that size that's it's really that simple and dumb and so for example if someone says I'm doing this approximation with this penalty function what it means is for some reason you don't you know errors that are between you know plus minus a how much do you care about them none zero you couldn't care less right um, somebody want to give me a case where that would be completely justifiable I mean with a I guess a small a or something yeah what's that you're trying to optimize for delivery this is plus my one minute you're, you're trying to optimize for what minimum delivery time for example dot yeah. Plus minus one, yeah, that's in the okay. Yeah, I, yeah I have, I'll, I, let me. I didn't quite get it. So, I mean, here's a very simple example: is you measure something, and the measurements are basically done with a five-bit converter, and so what you get is only there's only 32 possible values. So when you get a measurement, here's what you don't. What what you get? I mean, sure, I tell you the number in there. I pretend that's the number, but in fact, any measurement in this little interval would have mapped to that. So what that says here is for the penalty if I if I represent that here someone says why and you go oh, hello it's a six bit a to d converter like so uh, like uh, worrying anything if I interpret any any number smaller than that or, or here I'll, I'll go into dialect smaller than my LSB of my converter that was least significant bit then you say it's completely fictitious and means nothing right so that would be that okay yes Straight here rather than an inequality. Up here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, it, it, there is here. Yeah. Because I, I want to I measure the residuals. We could do the same thing with an inequality constraint here. If, if you were, I mean, it's a bit stranger, but you could do that. You can certainly do it with an inequality constraint as well, right? If you'd say, I'd like these inequalities to hold, and then you'd say, yeah, but I have weird, I have weird personal opinions about how much it irritates me to violate inequalities then it would be exactly an inequality and everything would work the same okay okay so we'll we'll just look at a little example um, here this is just like this is a matrix which is 100 high 30 wide so you have 30 X's and 100 uh, basically equations right uh, com generate completely randomly so this is just yeah but but this will tell you a lot um, 
So let's start with least squares. That's here. So if you do least squares and then you look at the hist then you look at the residual, the distribution of residuals, right? Um, then you know you see something reasonable, right? This shows you the penalty. This 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 shows you how much it irritated you to have a residual at that level. And what you can see is, you know, this is obvious for a quadratic, you know, around in here, it's really small. Why? Because if, well, if a quad, for a quadratic, if an error, if a residual is small, the quadratic charges you small squared. And small squared is like very small. In fact, some people even use the language where very small means, actually literally means small squared. Very, very small means small cubed and whatever, you know, something like that. And incredibly small indeed means something like the fourth power or something. That would be the analog of like jerk and uh, what's, what's one up from jerk? What is that? Snap. There you go. Okay, fine. So, okay. And you can see what happens. And you know, you could even go back and say like, woo, you had some big residuals here, right? Um, in fact, we can even anthropomorphize it and say like, ooh, that one really hurt because look at the height of this thing compared to like over here. Right? Um, okay, so this is least squares traditional thing. Um, for fun, let's see. Oh, let, let's look at log barrier next. For log barrier, um, this thing actually matches that almost exactly for small residuals. But what happens with log barrier is as your residuals get bigger and bigger, unlike least squares, you start getting, you get more and more upset compared to least squares because the log barrier is bigger than the square function, right? And so what happens is you can see it, by the way, all residuals were between plus and minus one. It had to be, otherwise you'd get infinity. Actually, the problem would be infeasible at that point, right? But the point is they're all between there and there. And you can almost say something like, well, this is least squares, but I put a big old, uh, I put a clamp on it and, and tighten the clamp so that all the residuals have to be between plus and minus one. Everybody, got, I'm just, you know, there's, by the way, there's nothing deep here. So don't, don't overinterpret. Um, dead zone linear is really cool. Let's take a look at that. So dead zone linear is kind of interesting because, um, first of all, what you did is you told the, let's say the solver or whatever, that once a residual is between plus and minus a half, yeah, plus and minus a half, you couldn't care less at all. If you're outside, you care, but in fact, it's going up linearly. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and so, not surprisingly, look at the, the residuals you get. And somebody uh, give me some English to explain, to anthropomorphize this and say, why do you get a whole bunch of things shoved right up against these two boundaries? Somebody want to just, I mean, you can't be wrong. This is just, we're just talking and anthropomorphizing it, right? So what, what would you say? Optimize it. There's no benefit. What's that? There's no benefit to me. Yeah, that's right. You'd say, well, you know, what it did was it shoved it shoved a whole bunch of residuals down to the boundary of where you don't care. And why should it expend any effort to make it smaller? That's perfect. Perfect. Everybody got that? Right. So, okay. It's kind of cool. Um, oh, and if I'd say, hey, look at this. You've got a bigger, you, you have a couple of bigger residuals than the square. I mean, this is hard to see on the scale, but we'll get to that. Let, let's go to the L1 one. This is L1. Uh, Anybody notice anything on the L1 thing? I mean, this is kind of an obvious thing. A whole bunch of the a whole bunch of the residuals are zero, not a whole bunch, like 35 or something, 30 or something like that. Okay, everybody got it. Um, to anthropomorphize that, we would go like this. Let's consider the square function, the square penalty, and the absolute value penalty for small residuals, right? When you have a square penalty and a residual becomes small, you start caring about it a lot less because your the, the amount you care about it is small squared. Everybody got it? Okay. For an absolute value, what happens is the marginal amount by which you care about reducing a residual keeps up until you hit zero. Okay? So in least squares, the difference between having a, a residual of nine and a residual of 10 is big. And the residual, the difference between having a residual of one and two is a lot less. Everybody got it? You just square those numbers and you figure it out, right? For an absolute value, the difference between having a residual of nine and a residual of 10 is identical to the difference between having a residual of one and two. Everybody got that? So I'm just, this is completely just, I'm just saying that it, and so 
So that's actually one interesting thing you'll see about a penalty function. If a penalty function has a sharp point, then you're actually, you will expect actually the solution to have lots of zeros. And someone would say, why? There's lots of ways to see this, right? And in other contexts, like in compressed sensing and all this kind of stuff, you, people could construct incredibly complicated theories about this. But the point is, it's just because the marginal improvement of making a residual smaller, if we anthropomorphize the whole thing, basically keeps up until it's zero. Okay? Uh, by the way, the opposite is like a, a square is kind of chill. It's like once it gets small, it's small squared. You still care, but you care a lot less. Everybody got that? And then dead zone linear, extreme. It's like, nope, actually, once you get in this band, couldn't care less. Everybody got that? So that's what a penalty, that's what the, the qualities of a penalty function near zero matter right? At the other end, we look at the qualities of a penalty function for large things, because that tells you, again, to anthropomorphize this, how a, well, okay, this is, that's, this is not, a, I was anthropomorphizing the solution method, but here, it's a, what that tells you is this, um, when things grow linearly, uh, that says you're more chill about having a couple of big residuals. I mean, right, because if I had a residual of like 10 and I'm doing square, that's like, it, it's, a, it's a big thing, okay? If you have a residual that, you know, but, but for an absolute value, that doesn't bother you as much. Everybody got this, right? So, okay, so that's going to shape, and that's going to come up as a theme. We'll see it's going to end up with what so-called robust estimators that we'll see. Yeah? Shouldn't the residuals for P equals 2 and log barriers still be a little more concentrated around zero because mm -hmm. there's still some like increasing penalty as you go away from zero, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so the question is why, why, why didn't these concentrate closer? Yeah. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I, I can assure you that these are the solutions, right? Um, and this is just this is literally randomly chosen data. Um, actually, what it tells you is this is the best it can do. That, that would be my, my best answer to that. But certainly, I can tell you this, if it could have concentrated them closer together, it would have. How about that? Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, um, so let me ask a couple of questions just for, what, and then you tell me what would happen. If I told you that my penalty function is this, here's my penalty function. There it is. Everybody got it? And I want you to tell me in words what it means. What do you care about? What bothers you about residuals? Right? So somebody explain it. What does it mean? Yeah, go ahead. Bias towards underestimating? Yeah, exactly. Right. So then what this says is that this says that you, uh, yeah, that, that it's going to irritate you. Positive residuals irritate you. I don't know. I'm going to eyeball it four times more than negative residuals, right? So, by the way, you won't be surprised. This function's gonna make an appearance when you do quantile estimation. But nevertheless, you might, some of you maybe already know that, but that's it, okay, cool. Um, let me, let's go the other way around. What if I told you that, look, residuals between uh, plus and minus a half, I couldn't care less. It's like our, our measurements are not even that good, that's fine. And then you say, do you have a preference between being less than minus a half and more than a half? And they go, yeah, I really don't want my residuals to be more than a half. Somebody suggest a penalty function. Go ahead, suggest, suggest a penalty function for that. Same thing, but with the dead zone? Yeah, so we put, we say, it's just flat zero in here. And then this grows steeply, and this grows like that. There you go. Okay. So, all right. And that's, so if you encountered a problem where that was your preference, now you know what to do. You just, and you just literally you type that in. That's two lines. I could make it one, but the point is it doesn't matter. Right. Everybody, everybody got this. So, and what if you said, you know what? Um, suppose I went, got even, suppose I said, you know what? I, it's okay. I, I, I care less if the residuals are less than minus a half. But actually, when they start getting like really negative, that irritates me more. Uh, that irritates me more. What would what would you do then? Yeah, you just put some put some curvature on this guy and just have it go up like that. 
right. So, I mean, this, so at some point, these are getting weird. But uh, anyway, so everybody got this? Yeah. You can absolutely have a piecewise, you know, a piecewise linear penalty function. Absolutely, right? That's not not at all uncommon, right? So actually, that's a very common model of fuel usage. So it comes up right there, right? So okay. Um, okay, this brings us to an interesting one. It's something everyone should know about because this is like I would I'd even put something like this in the top ten for the the things you should walk away from this class from um, is um, is is the the so-called Huber penalty, right? So uh, here it is. It's quadratic up to a threshold m. Above that, it grows linearly, and so. What happens is here, here's uh, here's Huber, and right here at one, it transitions to linear. So it's got linear tails here. Now the quadratic would keep going up here, and it would be start getting really like at one point five, it'd be two point two five, it'd be up here, right? So so quadratic, and then what does it mean? So somebody, you know, anthropomorphize this. If some someone says, "What are you doing?" You say, "I'm doing regression." What penalty are you using? Huber. Somebody explain what it means about how you feel about residuals in your regression model. What does it mean? Like just 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 in words. I don't want uh, no math. What would you say? Yeah. You can multiply residuals, and as it gets bigger, you're you. Yeah, you say. Look, I want to do least squares. You know, I kind of want to do least squares. But you know what? If if there has to be a big residual. I'm way more chill than if I was doing least squares. And so this is kind of, so these, the, the fact that these tails here grow linearly means, in fact, in statistics, it's called a robust, it's a robust penalty, right? So it's a robust estimator, right? So, okay, everybody, okay. So it's very innocent. It's just, it works, you know, uh, I guess we'll look at an example. And this is a baby example just to understand it, but, um, so here we're literally doing what, you know, regression from high school. So here's a bunch of points here. What you might not see is there's a point there and there's a point there. Okay? Um, and if you do the least squares fit, you get this dashed line. Okay? And actually somebody explain that to me. Why, why would that be the, the, the regression fit to those 42 points? These 40 points and these two weird ones out here. Like what? What happened? The squared residual is very large for those two points, so it tries okay. to minimize things. Right. So what it did was for these two points, the squared residual was way big, and that oh, we can anthropomorphize it and said that that put very strong incentive to change the fit to to reduce those two gigantic residuals. Okay. And the result is it got torqued this way. Actually, we can give a beautiful mechanical interpretation. Right. So. Again, if, if you don't mind, I'll, if you don't, this, well, anyone could know this kind of mechanical engineering. Very simple. Um, what you do is you make your penalty the potential of a spring. So a quadratic is what's called a hook spring. So you, know, you, you pull it out some amount of distance. Actually, it's a symmetric spring. You can pull it to the left, pull it to the right, and the potential energy is going to be the square of the displacement. Everybody got that? So what you should do is imagine this thing with wires on it and vertical springs that attach to it. And it's in mechanical equilibrium in least squares. That would be this. And someone would say, whoa, how did it get torqued out there? And you go, you just said it. That's exactly what happened. There's a giant torque on that, on that thing. Why? Because this is a spring. You imagine a spring here pulling this, and it's pulling it up. And there's a spring over here, and it's pulling it down. Everybody got it? Right, and you say that yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in here, but they're just they're those are just little displacements. They're putting a few newtons here and there on it. Okay, um, now let's talk about Huber, and let's do the mechanical interpretation. Mechanical interpretation is a super interesting spring. It's a spring where you expand it, and the energy goes up quadratically, but then you hit a point, and after that, the energy grows linearly. And what that means is it's a constant force. Everybody got that? And so what happens here is that. These springs are putting a, a, a force on this, but once, once you hit the boundary, it's a constant force, not 
one that continues to increase. Okay, so again, if that helped you, fine. If it didn't, just completely ignore it, uh, that, that interpretation. So everybody got this? So anyway, so what's obvious here? I mean, this is a note, this is like idiotic with, you know, points in R, you just plot things and whatever. In fact, for these things, you just draw a line through it or so it doesn't matter, right? Um, what I can tell you is this works, you get the same thing in cases where it's not remotely obvious. Um, so pretty much most times people are fitting data. It should probably be done with Huber, not least squares. So just pretty much, okay? That's, in fact, there are stunning examples of how well it just powers through, you know, outliers, right? So those examples where 20, 30% of your data points are just crazy outliers, and this thing just works. Everybody got this? So it's very cool. Uh, okay, so, you know, and, and it's named after Peter Huber, a statistician who described the, came up with the function, but reasoning from first principles about unknown distributions and blah, 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 right? So, but anyway, but that's our, so our amateur interpretation is simply that you, he's using a penalty that matches least squares for small things, but then grows uh, much more uh, gently for large residuals. And another way to say it is, it, it's cooler, it's let, it doesn't go crazy if there's a large residual trying to reduce it. And then you get that kind of arrow, this, sorry, this torque on, on this thing. Okay, everybody got that? So, okay. Um, we'll look at least norm problems. So least norm problems are, are similar, right? Uh, oh, I should mention every time I, we, we look at these things, we look at simple versions, but here are some things you know now. Um, we could do, you know, we, we could do, uh, here, go, go back to this and do nor norm approximation. We can add convex constraints and everything is cool. So for example, you could do, you know, Huber monotonic regression. How about that? There's probably five papers on that, okay? So someone tell me what is Huber monotonic regression? What would it mean? You'd use a, you'd just do regression, you use a Huber penalty, number one. And then the other thing is you add, you add the constraints, which is x1 is less than x2, is less than x3, is less, everybody got that? Okay, I, that is almost certainly super useful in some application. Everybody got it? Um, and, and so we would, you could anthropomorphize that and everything. So what, and what would we would, well, yeah, how would we, how would we say it? You just say it's nothing, it's a QP or something, right? It's like, it's, abs it's just nothing. Like we know how to solve that, right? And then they would say, oh, I know a very fancy algorithm for solving. And you'd just say, stop, stop right there. Just don't say anything else because you're just embarrassing yourself, right? Uh, we know 50 ways to solve it and all of them are better than yours. So anyway, just leave it that way. Okay, all right. So I'm, I'm not saying stuff like that. So you can complicate these things as much as you like or you could add non-negative. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. So let's go here. Least norm problems. Um, here you're minimizing a norm subject to AX equals B. I mean, it, you know, it's the, it's the projection of the of the solution set of AX equals B onto the origin, right? And, and if you want to project it onto some other thing, yeah, go ahead and put an X minus and then some target, right? Um, in estimation, this says I have perfect measurements or really, really good measurements, but I don't have enough of them. And so in that case, you'd say, well, yeah, no, I, I, I actually, I have temperature sensors on, on, on that, you know, on, on that chip. And you say, and what's your, you know, how good are they? And you go, oh, they're fine, more than we need. And you'd say, well, then what's the problem? And you'd say, well, the problem is I'd like to know what is the temperature at other points on the chip where I'm not measuring it. Everybody following this? That's, that's the problem. And that's the case where A is, A is X is gonna be the temperature at, at all, all the points. AX equals B um, it is going to be telling you that these are the measurements you would get at those points, this agrees with your measurements, but you don't have enough to determine X. And so the question is, what's X? And so then you'd say, well, I need a measure of plausibility. And the measure of plausibility here is that the norm of X is small, right? Um, then that's estimation. And in design, this would be, these would, you'd think of these as uh, uh, just constraints, right? Or requirements. And then you want to minimize the norm of this. So classic one is, for example, minimum fuel, uh, tr you know, uh, motion from one from one one place to another, right? So move my satellite back where it's supposed to be. Minimize the fuel. That perfect example, right? 
Um, or I don't know, it could be all sorts of other stuff. Anyway, that's it. Everybody got this? So that these are the these are examples of just you know high level least norm problems, and least squares again. It's you know it's something you know. Um, you can do sum of absolute values. That's that as I've mentioned several times. That's a, an elementary model of fuel use in some cases. Um, you can also do a least penalty problem like this, which is really cool. So you'd say here's my penalty. Um, that would actually be super useful because you'd actually go and ask somebody. Uh, tell me about your thrusters. And they would say, oh, whoa, they're super sophisticated. And they'd give you a booklet this thick. You could just read this and you'll understand it. It depends on the fuel and blah, blah. I go on and on. Very sophisticated, right? And then you'd say, well, to produce a certain number of Newtons, what's your fuel use, right? And then they would say, oh, yeah, no, there's a whole sequence of papers on that. And it'd be unbelievably complicated. I wouldn't understand any of it, anything. But at the end of the day, you'd say, can you draw me a picture, right? And it would almost certainly be convex. Right? And that would be your penalty. And then you'd say, then when you do this, you're actually literally doing, you're doing something very close to actual minimum fuel uh, trajectory design or something like that. Everybody, everybody got this? So that's the, that's the picture. Um, okay. Um, now you can do regularized approximation. And th these are ideas we're going to see in lots of other contexts, like statistical and others, right? So, but for now, um, so here you have a bi-criterion problem. So if you like, it's a vector optimization problem. You know, with if you want to be pedantic about it, you could say with over the cone r plus squared or something, right? And so that that looks like this. You'd say, you know, I really want ax minus b to be small, but I also want x to be small. So that that that's what this says. Um, and you know, and uh, est estimation is. Uh, I mean, this this we'll, we'll get into a lot of this later, but. Um, you know, that could be you have a linear measurement model, y equals ax plus v. And you could say, yeah, I, I, the noise here, I mean, my prior is that it's small. So it's small in, some, in, in, in this norm. These could even be different norms, by the way. In fact, they often are in applications, right? Um, then you'd say, oh, yeah, but I also have a prior that x is small. And then that would be, that would be this part here. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so here, for example, if we were going to but socially non-positive, but suppose I was going to, you know, work on a, a control a missile heading towards a target. And someone would say, well, what do you, what this thing is, is going to be uh, at the end, how close you are to the target, right? And so I'd say, how does that work? And they go, well, uh, okay, it wouldn't, in a depends, right? Now there's shape charges and things get like insane, but let's ignore that. And you just say, well, my kill probability, this would be the things they would say, depends on the inverse square of the distance from the target and blah, blah, blah. This would be old school non-shape charges, right? And that would tell you that this should be a two norm in R3, right? It, it's how, how close do you get? Um, and then X, the, the norm here could be something else, right? So, um, yeah. By the way, that would be a really good use for a penalty uh, right there, right? So as long as we're on a socially non-positive topic. Um, <laughs> so here's one. Ready? You'd say, well, you know, what's your, what, what's your penalty? And you say, oh, <laughs> if you get within 10 meters, that's fine. Thank you. And you go, how about two meters? And you go, uh, it's not going to matter. <laughs> uh, you get within 10, then that's good enough. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's, uh, anyway, that, that, and by the way, if you translate that into a penalty, what does that sound like to you? What is it? It says, in that case, it is a dead zone, literally. Thank you. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, sorry about this. But sorry, I don't know how we got onto this, but it just happened, right? Okay. And what if I tell you that if you're more than, you know, 50 meters, you know, 100 meters away, then you might as well have not even fired the missile. What does that sound like? Um, What's that? Um, yeah, it could be some kind of, it just means basically like don't even, like, you could actually literally put a, yeah, barrier, put some kind of barrier. Say, if you don't think, if you don't think according to your model you can get within 100 meters, and you know what? Don't even waste it. They're expensive or something like that. Okay? Yeah, so I'm just, this is just an example of where these kinds of discussions come up. Okay? So, okay. Um, uh, oh, a very interesting interpretation of this that we're going to come back to later is super cool. It's basically this. Someone says, why do you want, when you make this estimate, why do you want x small? Do you have a prior that x is small? And you're like, no, I don't. Then you go, but why do you want x small? The reason would be this. <laughs> Here's another very good reason. 
You say, I don't really know A that well. You go, okay, cool. I mean, that's actually true in almost any application, right? I, I don't know A that well. And you'd say, so what's this thing about X being small? And you go, well, uh, if you don't know, if A can vary, right? If, if A can wiggle around and you don't know it that much, let me ask you a question. How much would that matter if you chose X equals zero? Not at all. If you made X really big and you have AX and then A varies, what's going to happen to AX? What's that? It's big. Okay. So what it says is the following. You might want X small and someone would say, why? And you'd say, because look, in my model, X multiplies A. And you go, so? And you go, well, look at this. This, if A varies, since it multiplies X, right? The smaller X is, the less effect A varying has on AX. Again, this is unbelievable. I, don't try to read, don't make this sophisticated what I'm saying. It's as dumb as what I'm saying. Everybody got this? So that's another very good reason why you want might, you might want X to be small because it becomes, in AX becomes in sen less sensitive, okay? We, we will see lots about this later, okay? So, okay. All right. Um, so how do you solve these kinds of problems? Well, again, we've seen this before in the general context. You scalarize uh, the problem, right? And many ways to do this um, is, uh, you know, the, if you just apply the most direct way, you do this. You refer to this as your primary objective. And gamma is, uh, this is your secondary objective. And gamma weights the primary, and actually, it literally weights the secondary objective relative to the first. That's what gamma is here. People actually typically don't solve this. Um, instead, they would do something like that. And this has lots of names depending on who you hang out with, but it's ticking off regularization. I guess in Western statistics, it's called ridge regression, I think. And it's got, it probably has other names. Like, I don't know. Uh, okay, so, so, and it basically, uh, it says, yeah, I want AX minus B small and two norms squared. I mean, this has an immediate solution. It's like this thing, right? So, um, but that, that would be it. And we'll, we'll look at some interpretations of, of what that is and all that sort of stuff later. Okay. Um, all right. So our, our next example also is just going to show you this, a baby example of how you would, how you fiddle with the weights, right? Um, so actually, if you're doing statistical stuff, how do you, how do you, so, someone tell me, how do you choose the weights? How do you choose, like, let's say delta here in, if you're fitting a statistical model? I mean, we'll talk about this later, but how do you, how do you actually do it? There are wrong answers. Let's see. What, it, what is that? Cross validation. Ah, beautiful. That was the right answer. Good. Yeah. The, the wrong answer was to launch into some long theory about Gaussian and asymptotic this and that and blabber on and on. That was the wrong answer, even though those are interesting observations. And that's the right answer. Okay. So uh, it was cross validation, by the way, or just out of sample validation. Okay. We'll get, we'll get to that later. Okay. So this is another example. Um, by the way, a lot of times the scalarization is actually done by people and it's completely intuitive, right? Like you'd say, I want efficiency, but also ride quality. And you're like, well, how do they trade off? And you go, I don't know, show me some choices. And then somebody just makes a decision, right? So you don't have something as simple and obvious and defensible as cross-validation there, right? So, I mean, I guess you could do weird experiments. You could put people in the car and they could... They could finish a trip and go, whoa, oh, my back really hurts, but wow, it didn't cost very much the energy for that trip. Anyway, uh, you can't do that, I don't think, right? So that's not how it works, right? Um, okay, but this, this will be an example. In a lot of areas like, the, unfortunately, in some areas like image processing, it's endemic, where people just turn knobs until they like what they see. So it's fine. I'm not making fun of it, right? So, okay. Um, control is another one, right? Where they, they just make stuff up and it's fine. They, they turn knobs and then they like what they see. So anyway, um, all right. Um, so we'll do, this is kind of a classic problem. It's like optimal input design. So I have an input, which is a, in this case, it's a time sequence U and what comes out is another time sequence Y and they're just related by convolution. So this would be called in dialect, a linear in, you know, EE or something, ME dialect, it's a linear dynamical system or something like that, right? It's a linear system. And I think in math, you would say it's a convolution kernel 
with uh, this, the H is the convolution kernel, and this is just the convolution, right? Um, so here's your job. Um, we, uh, you got a couple of uh, objectives. Uh, the first one is you care about the tracking error. So there's some desired trajectory. You want the output to do something. We don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just being constant or go to a certain value, or maybe it follows some pattern, right? That, that's, this is, that's, your, that's this one. And this would be called your tracking error, right? At the same time, you want the input magnitude to be small, right? Uh, so, and I'm just using the L2 norm squared because why not? It's traditional and so on, right? Um, and you also might want the input that you're going to apply to be smooth. And so you take the sum of the squares of the differences, right? Something like that. Um, okay. And you'd end up, then you form a regularized least squares uh, problem, and it would look like this. You know, so this you'd say my tracking error is my is my first um, is my primary objective, right? Um, my secondary and tertiary objectives are maybe I want this small I want I want the input small and I want it not too wiggly. There you go. And then the numbers delta and eta here are the ones that tell you how much you care about the input being small and or wiggly compared to your tracking error, right? So. By the way, hilariously, the same problem comes up, not just in control and mechanical engineering. You get exactly the same thing like in finance. Like you'd say, like your primary one might be, I need to track this bond portfolio, you know, plus or minus 30 basis points or something like that. And this would be like, uh, I want, this would be like, in fact, instead of the derivative, you'd literally have what's, you'd, you'd literally have the, what they'd call the turnover, which would be the, the amount of trading you do, right? Um, this would have a, the, the magnitude would mean something else entirely. But the point is, this problem is repeated in 50 different fields or problems very like this, right? Okay. All right. So this is the idea. And it's just a least squares problem. I mean, w later we're going to come back and I'm going to swap these for other, other penalties. And I'm going to ask you, like, what do you think is going to happen? Okay. But for now, they're not. So, and this is, this is what it might look like. And it's just, this is just silly to, but just to see how this looks. Um, so at the top, delta is zero, but I totally forgot. Delta penalizes the derivative, okay? Okay, so in the top, delta is small, right? And oh, by the way, uh, what I want to track is, uh, yeah, I'll tell you some here, that, that thing. I'll, I'll, here's the dialect for that. That'd be like a square wave, right? And, and I think I've heard it in control called something else. It's, an, it's like a, it's a specific maneuver. Like I want this thing to go here, Right, and then later go there, and then go back. So it's anyway. There's an, even a name for that, which I forget, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, so that's what you want it to do. And here's what's cool. Here's an input you create. It looks like this, right? And you know, look at that. It actually tracks it like really well. I mean, you know, that's what this math is for, right? So it does that. Um, and you could give all sorts of. Obviously, the system here has some oscillatory stuff in it, right? Uh, that, to, to make this interesting, right? And you could, you could, people would give all sorts of crazy stories about what's happening here. Like I, I have friends in mechanical engineering who would say, oh, that's very clever. And you go, what is this? And you say, well, you're exciting these high frequency modes in this thing in just the right way so that when the real thing goes down, it, you won't excite those modes and blah, blah. I don't know, they go on and on. And I mean, it kind of makes, I mean, they, and they appear to know what they're talking about amongst each other, right? So it's fine. But, but that, but I'm just saying they could, they, they, they would look at that and explain it, right? So, um, okay. So, uh, what happens is you say, no, 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 this input is too wiggly. Uh, so, um, right. So what we're going to do, actually it's too big, right? Because look, it goes down to like minus nine and plus five. And you'd say, so what I'm going to do in the middle is I'm going to put, uh, I'm, I'm still, I don't care about wiggliness, but I'm going to turn up eta. What ADA will do is it's going to increase your tracking error. You can see that over here, right? That you're not tracking as well. But you, now you have an input that's a lot, you know, whatever. It's like three times smaller, roughly, right? Or order of magnitude, right? So that'd be the idea. Um, and then finally, you would say, let's crank up uh, the smoothness. And you would get something that looks like that. And that's a nice smooth input. And, and this is the, the tracking error you'd get, okay? And then how would this actually work if you were doing this? Probably people would look at it and go, no, tracking error is too big here. And you'd back off, you know, one or the others. And you say, no, it's too wiggly. No, it's too big, too small. And you'd go back and forth until you were either bored or satisfied, right? So that's, right. That's, that's called uh, hyperparameter tweaking.
in, and and uh, if you think it's bad in machine learning, it's really bad in control, right? But that's fine. Uh, okay, everybody got this? I mean, this is all kind of obvious, right? I think here. Um, so I think what we'll do is actually I think we're going to quit here, and we'll uh, we'll we'll continue on Thursday.